Up next, we have our show and tell. Uh, we have 13 people uh, are going to show off a puzzle or, or a few puzzles. There's no particular theme this year. Could be something that the person cut, uh, something they found for five cents at a flea market, a charity valuable, just something very unusual, or their favorite puzzle they want to talk about. Uh, I ask all of you who are coming up to present to have your puzzle with you, not back at the table, back at your room. Uh, I even encourage you to, right now to maybe come up and find uh, a chair that's up close so it doesn't take too long between presenters. Uh, that being said, I think we are okay on time. Uh, there's a little buffer between this and lunch. So if you run over your three minutes, uh, I'm not going to start playing Oscar music and rip the microphone out of your hand. <laughs> Um, come up here, I'll give you the microphone. I will hold your puzzle up, but obviously um, people here, it's hard to see uh, the puzzle from this distance. There's the pictures here, so after you are, are done talking about your puzzle, I encourage you to put it down on the blue table over here and perhaps maybe stand by it for a little bit afterwards. I think people in the room would like to come up and look at it more closely and perhaps ask you questions about it. Uh, I'm particularly excited to, to hear you all about your puzzles because I've been uh, collecting the images from the presenters and so I see these images, maybe know, maybe know the title of it, but I, I don't know the backstory. I'm really curious what you're all going to say about it. Um, first up, we have someone, I may mispronounce this person's name, help me out. Is there a Bob Armstrong? <laughs> First in line, not the children. It's the old people. Bob, the the Walk over here so that the camera can video this whole thing. Oh, so is the image on the screen? Ah. This puzzle is the best example of personalization I've ever seen. The artwork was all designed specifically to celebrate the set, settlement, settlement of the Valley Farm Road in 1820 by a family whose last name was Sears. And uh, the first name, it says, the top says, when P, and that's the female, was by T, that's the male, was one and wed. Got that? And believe it or not, in the lower middle, underneath the carriage, it has the Valley Farm Road 1820, and it has the name of the two adults, Elkana. You've all heard of Elkana, haven't you? Oh, yeah. Familiar old name, L. Sears, and Maria C. Sears. Elkanah married Maria, and they had three children, thankful A. Sears, age eight years, in a month, Doroas, D-R-O, D-R-R, D-O-R-O-A-S, L. Sears, age two years, three months, and Joseph Y. Sears, six years, and they are, go right down, uh, the, the oldest, thankful is the oldest one on the left, and the Middle one is the youngest, and then Joseph, the son, is older. You can tell by their legs who's bigger. <laughs> how, the question is, how did a puzzle like this escape a well-to-do family? You just don't know. I tried to do some uh, research on, uh, what do you call it? Ants? Genealogy. Genealogy. But I, I'm not the expert on that. And all I know is it's come into my possession. Um, it has had no replacement pieces, uh, no other, no damage to it. So it was maintained over the years. Probably cut, I think, estimated. Estimated cutting was in the 1960s, and um, it was just sold to me by a person. Again, the name was not related to Sears in any way. So that is, to me, a bitter disappointment when I see puzzle like that leave the provenance, leave the home of a family when at one time it meant so much. And it's, it's a celebration puzzle. So it's a question.
quite a quite a puzzle with all their regular edges and everything else. And obviously, it's a power. Everyone understand it's a power puzzle. Okay. Thank you. We didn't have a closer up image, uh, um, so it's a perfect example of you can go a little closely. You can see the names and the ages of the of the children there. Up next, we have um, Camille. So the puzzle I'm bringing today is made by uh, Hélène Médéjtovin, who's a French uh, marketer or marketery maker. Uh, she's based in Normandy. And what she does actually most of the time is the marketery. So marketery is this very old craft or art to apply veneer of different types of wood uh, to create uh, decorative panels or furnitures uh, things like that. And the story is that one day she missed a marquetry. So she decided to use the scroll saw for something else than doing the marquetry to make a puzzle. And she had lots of fun with it. So she now she enjoy, enjoys doing uh, puzzles as well as the board games that she makes. So she also makes chess boards and things like that. And she has fun building tricky edges, things like that. And uh, she sells on Etsy, although for the moment she doesn't accept to sell abroad, so I'm happy to help if people want to find some, but let me tell you some more about how it's done. So she's cutting the wood uh, with a scroll saw. She gets some, sometimes some colored wood, like you can see here, from her provider. And she does the shading with a technique which she's using uh, heated sand, very fine sand that is heated, and then she used tweezers to put the wood in the sand so as to create these burns and to make, uh, to make this, this very nice effect on, on the puzzle. So I chose this one to bring because it's, uh, it shows very much the marker tree. It's also uh, in a tray, so it's easy to transport. That was easy for me to, to bring. And now on the, on the puzzle side, uh, so the veneer is mounted on a very thick uh, medium MDF or maybe low density fiber, if one can call it this way, which makes it very smooth. So on the puzzle side it's not that good because if you miss place a piece and you want to take it apart, you can actually wipe the fiber on the bottom. And also being very thick, so it's one centimeter thick or 0.4 inches if I'm correct, but I'm not so sure. Um, it, it, the blade was not always perpendicular to the table. So you have to put the pieces on one side but not the other. And I have that issue on all of the puzzles I have from her but one, just so you be warned. Uh, but as you see, it's a very nice puzzle. I really treasure it. And uh, feel free to come have a look at it closely because it's really nice to see. Thank you. Up next, uh, Greg Fullerton. Okay, this this will uh, be a quick. There we go. Okay, quick uh, presentation. I have the puzzle here in my hand, but there's no way you can see it. But you can see it on the board here. And we've got three slides there all together. We can put it on the table. Right now. Okay. Um, and this is something I found at Hilton Head Island probably in the late 1990s at a sort of upper end um, a gift shop at um, um, the, the main little city there. Uh, the uh, owner of the shop didn't know anything about its past. I, for some reason, have some thought it was made from someone abroad. Uh, I was brought in part to see if anyone would recognize the maker. I've seen anything like this, any cousins or nephews of this sort of puzzle. It has three layers. There are 22 pieces there all together. Now this is obviously not an interlocking puzzle. It's not a push-fit puzzle. The best thing I can say is a push-feel push puzzle because you, you, you don't know where the borders are and the only way that you can feel for certain that the piece is in the right place is when it somehow connects with the one next to it. And you know that just by the feel. So it's sort of interesting. Um, we may go to slide number two. That's the first layer that you have there. So if you have a photo, that helps out a lot, but without a photo, it really takes some time to put this together. 
There are a couple or three pieces that represent the second level, which is not shown here. Then if we go to the third shot, it's the completed puzzle right there. Now I have this, uh, I'm an attorney, I have folks that come in and sit across from my desk, and I have this on the corner of my desk. And I use this as an interesting, uh, uh, well, sideline or, or something to uh, attract their attention. When I walk out of the office uh, to uh, get some copies made or get something else and come back, invariably somebody decides I just sort of take a few pieces apart. And I've found from experience that if they get more than four pieces apart, they cannot get it back together before I come back into the room. And so they're fidgeting there trying to put it back like it was. Now there may be some folks who are very successful putting it back and I don't know that they ever took it apart and, uh, and therefore they don't confess that they had done that. Sometimes they'll make a comment about it. But anyway, it's a, it's a very interesting puzzle. Uh, those three layers are there. If you know anything about who might have uh, designed this, there was some con uh, comment from John Cabot that uh, Saul Proboff might have made it. He's a um, uh, major collector of mechanical puzzles, and you can't argue this is in the mechanical range. I, I don't know whether this is a uh, puzzling um, art uh, form here or an artistic puzzle, uh, but whatever you wish to call it, it's nonetheless sort of tantalizing, sort of an outlier from a regular jigsaw. Yes? Oh, great. Okay, from Arizona, and the name again was? I don't know his name, but he sold them under the name of Paracelsus. Paracelsus, Paracelsus, okay. Yes, he made some larger ones, and he made some more three-dimensional water solving. Okay, great. Okay, appreciate that. This is, this is metallic. So that's what we're doing. Nice. When I saw the photos, I thought it was sculpted stained wood, and it, it's really heavy, interest metal. I'd like to try that later. Yeah, okay. it's also, it's, the layers kind of uh, fit together. It's like a three-dimensional push-fit puzzle, if you will. It was put, in, it was put in place, into place when it was both, both soft and Up next, uh, Aaron Boxerman. I think uh, probably have the uh, puzzle that has the least amount of pieces in show and tell today, so we'll find out. Um, so if you're familiar with Stave history, uh, you may have come across or heard of this puzzle before. It uh, came out in 1989. Um, it was actually, from what I understand, was put out as an April Fool's Day kind of puzzle called Five Easy Pieces. So it's a little hard to tell. I didn't bring it with me because it's, it's, it's a little fragile and stuff. But you can kind of see there's five pieces that make up this circle. So, um, the story, it's more of a story than really about the puzzle, but um, according to Steve, about 40 people or so purchased this puzzle, and um, I guess uh, they were waiting to hear back, apparently from people, you know, what they thought of the puzzle, and a month goes by, and uh, hadn't heard anything. So, um, I believe Steve, the owner, from what I understand, he talked to one of the Wonder. Could you talk a little? Oh, sorry. He talked to one of the uh, people that um, had purchased it about a month later and said, "You know, what's uh, what do you what do you think of the puzzle?" He's like, "I can't solve it, and, and um, I've been working on it, but I know I'll get it." So, turns out there is no solution. This was a prank puzzle. Like, no matter what you do, you can kind of see on the on the uh, puzzle over here. Like, you see how it doesn't fit. That one goes in, and it's, it's just a little off on the bottom. There's no way to solve it. And it made people extremely upset. Um, and in fact, as it says, he says, he, I guess he had to re people return them and, and had to uh, give refunds for this puzzle. So it's actually a very rare puzzle. I happen to have purchased one from my collection from someone that had, did not return it, so this is an example of that. Um, and it, in this... And I've heard that they weren't going to put it out again for this reason, but I have come across in like 2011, 2013, I found a couple um, that were dated that uh, more modern version. So I'm sure they made people aware that there's no way to solve it. Um, it was some sort of promotion they did about 10 years ago, I guess. So anyway, that's, that's my show and tell. Thanks, and of course, when I saw this photo, I really tried to think how it was made. 
there's some level of double cutting, but even I, I can't figure out how they did multiple layers to make it look like it should fit, but it doesn't. Up next, Chaz Bridge. So this is the woodworm again, um, and uh, I just wanted to go over a, a, a couple of details. Um, I was telling you last night that I, I, uh, I cut this in one continuous cut, which I normally do, but uh, for this puzzle, because it was uh, so much longer than it was high, I, I ended up making one piece out of the edge here, and then another piece out of the edge here, which kind of forced me to make a, a much more convoluted path to my one continuous cut. Uh, I found, found that if I didn't do that, uh, I would sometimes end up with an inadvertent fissure through the middle somehow that the puzzle would come apart uh, when I didn't intend it to. Uh, uh, the other thing that I wanted to talk about is I've got a bunch of uh, uh, eight and a half by 11 pictures to describe a little better how I get the veneer onto the MDF. It's a little bit too complicated for a talk here, I think. Okay, that's all for me. Uh, Michael Servo? Yeah. It's actually Mike and Rachel. Awesome. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. No, no worries. It's okay. Um, Rachel's actually my wife, but she's also the uh, CEO and creative force of our company. Uh, we own Micro Puzzles, which are the small uh, little testing puzzles. We started the company in 2018 out of our bedroom, uh, one bedroom apartment, and we've expanded to a 3,000 square foot facility in, or near Orlando. So if you're ever near, if you're ever near Walt Disney World, you can come see us. Um, in 2020, we had the opportunity to buy this, which is an original John Spilsbury from 1767. We have a, a we have a puzzle collection of one, which is this. <laughs> so, so it's go big, go home. Um, you go to the next slide. Um, it came with the original box, the original label. Um, the only thing I think it's missing is on the reverse of the cover, which you can kind of see at the top. I believe they had um, a print of the actual puzzle. Um, if you go to the next slide, it's there. Yeah, that's actually what it looks like. So it's, uh, it's North and South America in its um, uh, principles. It's missing a piece, uh, but it's spectacular. It's, uh, it's mounted on mahogany. It's uh, double-sided. It, it's, uh, the print is on one side, it's uh, uh, paper on the other. And they, I believe they, they took the grain of the paper and actually reversed it on the back. It's incredible condition. We didn't bring it. Unfortunately, it's, two, it's almost 260 years old and we didn't want to, we're kind of, we feel like we're stewards of it and we didn't want to like, you know, have, have it survive 260 years and then, <laughs> you know, on a plane ride to uh, Sturbridge. Um, um, but yeah, it's, it's an amazing shape. It, it's completely flat. Um, it's, you would never guess it's that old. It's, it's amazing. So. Could you tell us where you found it? Oh. Yeah, you bet. We actually found it in Europe in a, uh, at a dealer. Um, and I, my wife greenlighted the sale, which was amazing. <laughs> um, but we had contacted uh, Ian Williams to, uh, and just said like, listen, and we, s we just found this. We're thinking about you know, jumping off the deep end and buying this thing, what do you think? And she was very, um, very helpful in, in helping us make the decision. Um, but yeah, so when we just thought we were a puzzle company, it's kind of fun to have this kind of piece. Um, and we've got it on our website too, so there's a little more, there's a lot more pictures and there's a little more description because we, you know, sometimes when puzzles go in, and artifacts go into private hands, you know, they get locked away and you never see them kind of thing. So it's kind of nice to... How big is it? It's, I don't know, it's like 17 by, it's not perfectly square, um, but it's, it's pretty big. Yeah, it's, it's like that. So. Just like this. <laughs> <laughs> Scientific. <laughs> so.
Yeah, but yeah. that's it. But, so. uh, but honestly, if anybody wants to come out in Orlando and you can you can actually make the puzzle yourself and you know, we we got a little instruction on how we're supposed to yeah. handle it now after yesterday. So uh yeah. we, went, <laughs> we we went to the aquarium um, society, which was fantastic, and thank you for setting that up. But we went and we talked to some of the curators and we just were like, oh my gosh, we've been storing it all wrong. <laughs> and just everything. <laughs> They're like, you know, because they're like, well, you're not keeping it in the box, are you? And we're like, okay, no. <laughs> so, and we learned all about just, you know, non-acid paper and all that stuff. So as soon as we get home, we're gonna, we're gonna fix it. <laughs> awesome, thanks. Becca Boyden. Hi, I'm here with my husband, Jeffrey Cunningham. We come from two families that cut puzzles and collect puzzles and do puzzles. So I brought three examples with me, sort of riffing on um, what Bob Armstrong was doing on the provenance of puzzles and keeping them in the family. Um, let's see, let's go to slide number two and see what we've got there. No, slide number three. We got Okay, so this is a, um, this is actually a, puzzle of my father's. This is called Norwegian Fjord. This is in the brown, the brown, the brown box. So my dad started cutting puzzles in the 1920s as a young man, and his brother cut puzzles. Um, in fact, Ann Williams had one of his brother's puzzles at one point that's now up at the museum in, in Rochester. Um, and I think other members of that branch of our family cut puzzles as well. This is one probably cut in the 60s or 70s by my dad when he started cutting puzzles again for his family. Um, he did a lot of puzzles for us kids and the grandkids. Um, so there was a whole tradition of, of puzzle cutting and making puzzles. My grandfather on my mother's side uh, had a huge collection of Strauss puzzles. So that was a puzzle making branch on my mom's side. Um, then you can back up and we'll get, um, okay, so this is Jeffrey's uncle, Roger, Twitchell Puzzles. That's the, the little square box there. He's, uh, he was in York, Pennsylvania. He just died a couple of years ago. He cut puzzles for years and years and years for the family. He cut a Christmas card puzzle for his uh, sister and his nephews every year. Uh, he'd send a Christmas card, then they'd send it back, and then he turned it into a puzzle for them. It was very cool. Um, this is uh, um, Quarrel of Oberon and Titania. If you look, come to the afterwards, you can read the um, not quite acceptable racy note that he, poem, doggerel, that he wrote to Jeffrey's mom when he gave her this puzzle. Um, it's a really neat puzzle. He does nice, complex, tiny cuttings like a lot of you folks do now. Um, and then the third one we have is Autumn Castle. That's Jeffrey's brother, Keith, Roger's nephew. Um, and he, uh, Keith gave this to us as a Christmas present. It's Blair Castle, actually. Keith just told us that this week, or his wife, Pat, told us that. Um, it was a castle they visited in Scotland, and they got the print of it. She said, oh, we, we never cut, we never do it unless we visited there and gotten the print, which I thought was very cool. So these are all puzzles that were cut by family that are still in the family. A nice sidebar of this is that Pat, Keith's wife, grandfather cut puzzles. And so her grandfather's puzzles are in her collection. So, and she won't loan them because she's afraid they'll get lost. And I tried to loan her a puzzle this week and she said, no, 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 she wouldn't do that either. So again, very protective of the provenance of the puzzles and them staying with the family. And then just one other little extra add-on is my sister is married to um, actually a, just a cousin of Jeffrey's and his family cuts puzzles, he cuts puzzles and his, both of his uncles cut puzzles, and his grandfather cuts puzzles, and his great uncle cuts puzzles. So my latest idea is that there needs to be a kind of, I do family history and genealogy, so we need to do a kind of um, a puzzle family genealogy thing where you, where you do some kind of graphic mapping of how the families are interconnected 
by the fact that members of the family make puzzles. And I started talking about this last night at dinner, and Ann Williams was there frantically writing it all down in the notebook. So I think we've got I think we've got a project. And since we're you know since we're only a few hours apart, and there's the internet, maybe there's maybe there's a new puzzle genealogy thing in the future. Thanks. Thank you, Becca and Jeffrey. Up and up, next, Lauren Daywood. Hello. Uh, just a quick question. How many people out Hello. here? Like my phone. phone up. Okay, how many people here have been asked when someone found out that you cut puzzles? You must have a lot of time on your hands. I get asked that question, and I say, this is what I do with my time. Uh, my puzzle is framed. All of my puzzles are framed because I dropped them and had to solve them again. Uh, this puzzle has a fun story. I showed it on Facebook, and somebody said, oh, I want that one. And I shipped it to them, and I asked, as I usually do. Sorry, I'm going to adjust because I'm very shy. <coughs> Anyway, so I said, do you want it assembled or not? And he said, oh, I want to fit solve it myself. So I put it in a bag, and I shipped it off, and I found one piece on the bench. I'm like, you'll get two packages. <laughs> so I sent the second package right away. Guess which one got there? <laughs> you know, you know. Pete knows. Pete, are, we, are you here, Pete? Yeah. So, so he got the first one, and several days later, <laughs> he got the second one. And I, I'm, I'm guessing you put it together. I don't know. Yeah. Well, anyway, so the first thing I did after I sold the puzzle to him, it's like, well, I want mine. So I made another one. Okay, great. And then I found out that I had done that, and I made another one. You know, like, so this is the puzzle that a few of you have already seen. I keep one of them in my pocket. The pieces are small because I was challenging my very thin saw blade. I went, how small a puzzle piece can I make? It cuts 55 ten thousandths wide. So eh, I might be able to go a little smaller, but then they would be pushed in. Not good. Make sure to get through all your slides, yes. Up next, uh, Michael Card. Thank you. Um, can we go to the last photo? I think it'll be best to see the completed puzzle. Um, this is a puzzle cut by a French cutter contemporary named Genet de Fos, uh, also known as Le Colimaçon, which means the snail in French. And all of his puzzles have a snail uh, uh, signature piece. Um, I really love his cutting. I, I like a puzzle that lasts a long time, um, you know, 10 to 20 to 100 hours. So um, Jeunesse tends to specialize in color line cut, uh, very intricate uh, puzzles that have a thousand or more pieces. Um, in this case, this is a puzzle that was commissioned by somebody else, and Jeunesse, Jeunet also often cuts uh, two or three copies in a stack, and so I got the second copy in the, in the stack of two that he had cut. Um, and this was an image that I don't think Janae probably would have picked on his own. Um, he, he really isn't something that lends itself very well to color line cutting. So what he did instead was, um, it's maybe hard to see, I actually have the puzzle over on a display table along with a couple other examples of his work. Um, but he kind of came up with this um, tadpole shaped piece that he just very cleverly uh, uh, cut up in, in a very random style that if you flip the puzzle over, it kind of looks like a brain. He also made the, the edges not uh, perfectly square, so you really can't start uh, from, from the edge and work your way in. Um, this puzzle, I often time my puzzles and I kind of compare the difficulty level one versus the other, and um, this one at 1,156 pieces took me just over 20 hours, um, which is actually pretty easy for Janae's puzzles. Um, I've done one about that size, and it took almost 40 hours. 
Um, and it broke down to the entire image, or the entire figure, I should say, taking about 11 hours, and then that black background taking the remaining nine hours. Um, uh, so that, that's Janine Aldefoss. Thank you. Thanks. The lovely, lovely cuts on that puzzle. Uh, next, uh, Ginda Fisher. Ginda. Ginda. Sorry, Ginda. And so, you know, it's sort of a fun connection. Uh, the photo is one that I took while canoeing on Lake Winnipesaukee in New Hampshire. Um, on the right is Three Mile Island, and which is the base of an Appalachian Mountain family camp where I've spent many, many years with my family. On the left is a tiny little island called Rock Island, which is the name of the puzzle. Um, this, um, that's, uh, that's, I'm sorry. Right here is where I spent many happy hours as a child reading on the Little Rock Island all by myself. Um, and um, John matched the styles to the sections of the puzzle. And so when I worked it to put it together for this event, um, I didn't need to turn the pieces over to sort. Um, and you can see here, I showed a couple of pieces. I highlighted a couple of pieces where you can see the transition from one, one style to another style. So you can see this is like the, the round one and this is the pointy one. Um, and um, so there are a handful of figurals in this puzzle, uh, including this is, that's John's signature piece. That's actually my signature piece. I don't cut puzzles, but when I commission a puzzle for myself, I always ask for that piece to be included. And he put it, you know, where I sat. So it makes it a very personal puzzle. It's one of my favorite puzzles. Thank you very much. I have to say, I recommend taking a close look at that. The pieces are beautiful, and you can see the, the different styles from top to bottom. Uh, Anne Williams? It's already on its way to the Strong Museum because of its historical significance. And <clears throat> I'm always interested in the history of puzzles. And a couple of years ago, as I noticed that during the pandemic, there were so many new puzzle companies starting up. A lot of cardboard puzzle companies, but also a lot of people who were starting to make puzzles at home uh, many of them using lasers, and I started thinking, well, it's probably interesting to talk about the origins of laser cutting. And I wrote this article for the AGPI Quarterly, which is this beautiful magazine that is edited by Dave Beffenegrini. Dave, take a bow. Uh, Dave, stand up and take a bow. Um, and I... I found that I asserted in this article that Robert Long, Longstaff in England was the first to make laser cut wooden puzzles. Now, if I were a politician, I would just say mistakes were made. Um, I'm gonna say it out loud, I made a mistake. Oops. Um, I was looking at this puzzle from my collection recently and um, thinking, oh, you know, I don't know if I want to do this again, maybe I should sell it. 
And I noticed some strange things about it. Um, there are a couple of figure pieces in the sky. There's an arrow, there's a, a cross-country runner, um, there's, a, a couple, there's a heart down here in the rocks, and they stand out more than most uh, figure pieces. And I pulled them out and I looked at them more carefully, and I realized that I thought they had been cut with a laser. And I happened to have met Tim and Blake Giles back in the early 80s. Um, they were the sons of a man in Maine who made jigsaw puzzles out of wood. He used a saw. He hired his kids to do all the strip cutting. And uh, Tim uh, was a graduate of Dartmouth College. He graduated in 1981. And he, had, he had figured he'd cut millions of pieces as a teenager working for his dad. The, he decided that since he was majoring in engineering, he was going to write his senior thesis on laser cutting of jigsaw puzzles. So I actually have read his senior, I got a copy on interlibrary loan, and I've read his senior thesis, and he came up with a, a system for cutting uh, jigsaw puzzles on, uh, wooden jigsaw puzzles uh, with lasers. Now, the, what you see is that uh, this heart figure piece, it's got the charring that is typical of laser cutting. Uh, from the heat of the laser, it chars the wood. All the other pieces were cut with a saw. So this is sort of a hybrid puzzle. Uh, and so I contacted Tim, he still lives in New England, and he told me that once he graduated from Dartmouth, he moved uh, to Florida where his dad was at that time. Uh, and he and his younger brother Blake set up a company called Stockdale Technologies. <coughs> and uh, they started out uh, cutting uh, wooden puzzles with saws as Tim perfected his engineering design for the laser cutting. And then they got to the point where they were cutting these hybrid puzzles where the figure pieces were laser cut and all the other pieces were cut with a saw. And then they wound up cutting entirely with lasers. Um, unfortunately, the puzzle, I don't have one of the entirely cut with lasers puzzles. And uh, Tim did not keep any. They wound up deciding that cutting wood with lasers was, they just didn't like it. Uh, they didn't like the charring, they, they, they didn't think it was clean, and they started, uh, they moved from wood into plastic, into uh, acrylic, and uh, started cutting acrylic puzzles in about 1984. The laser cutting was before 1984, 1982 or 1983, and they started supplying k Enterprises in Baltimore uh, with something called the Stockdale Super Square, uh, this is an example of one that I bought in 1986 from Kate and of Kate on Enterprises. And here is her uh, display at the International Puzzle Party of International Puzzle Party in 1986. And I think everything just about in this display was laser cut by Stockdale Technologies. So I just wanted to correct that error that I had made, and I hope to write up a, an article for uh, the AGPI Quarterly this fall, uh, talking not, a, not only about Tim and Blake and their work, but also about Jeremy's, Jerry Giles' uh, work before them as a wooden puzzle cutter. So, thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Anne. It's Rachel Dupre. Oh, for her. Okay. Well, we are uh, ahead of schedule, and we have a last-minute person that wanted to come up who's not on the slideshow, but uh, John Roosh. I don't have any photos, but I sent you a Facebook link. I don't know. I we can't handle that. Sorry. Okay. So we'll see it at the table. So uh, I've posted the I've, I've posted these on uh, the Facebook page. Uh, 
I think, I don't know, a few months ago, there's a woman named Sandra Carson who made mosaic puzzles in the 1980s and early 1990s. And uh, they're very unique because the pieces aren't just cut mosaic from an image. The pieces, uh, you can't see this, but you'll see it either on Facebook or we'll talk about it on the table. But the pieces actually form the, the picture of the puzzle and they're cut out of three uh, quarter inch pine. And what she did is she would draw the mosaic and then she had her woodworking partner, husband, I'm not sure what he was, he would cut the pieces out and then she would individually stain and paint the pieces uh, to make the puzzles. And then they were put into a frame and then they have a, another frame that covers it with glass in it with latches on the back. So I'll have it on the table. They're fairly unique, and I'll have some pictures of some other ones that she made. Um, I don't, I've never seen anything like it. There's a little story behind it. I bought mine in 1990. I showed them to Kim Kaiser, my neighbor, and oh, I like those. And about a week later, she comes back and tells me she found three of them in a garage sale, was it? For $25. So, wherever the table is, I'll be there with the puzzle. You can look at it. Thank you. Uh, and I, uh, Anne makes mistakes. Well, I made a mistake. I forgot to add Steve Gordon's photos to the list and and he doesn't have the puzzle with him, but I apologize profusely. He makes, he makes uh, custom ma mazes on paper, but he also cuts puzzles, and he commissioned me to cut a puzzle of a maze. Um, it's good work. I'm sorry we don't have any photos of it. But... That's right. It'll remain a mystery. I have some clues, though. So yes, my name is Steve Gordon. I hail from Newton, Massachusetts, and my presentation is gonna take less than three minutes, so everybody can actually stand up. <laughs> Shake out your arms and legs. So I found that people listen better when the blood is flowing to their body. Come on, I'm gonna make you do the wave too. Come on, this is part of my presentation. Everybody, wave, come on. Trust me, you will thank me for it later, yeah. Doesn't that feel good? All right, Woo. Okay, um, so what would you call a colorful wooden jigsaw puzzle of a jigsaw puzzle piece? Now, the puzzle's in a box, but I do have, I do have a shirt with a, well, it's got some hints on it to what the puzzle looks like, but the puzzle's much cooler than this, okay? So again, a colorful wooden jigsaw puzzle of a, puzzle piece, but wait, there's more. Inside that piece is a hidden maze of jigsaw puzzle pieces. You're thinking, hey, that's pretty meta, right, Steve? Yeah, cool. Now throw in puzzle piece-shaped whimsies and puzzle piece-shaped dropouts of various sizes, okay? Now, meta definitely comes to mind, I know, I know. Does this puzzle have smooth, recognizable border pieces? Of course not. <laughs> Dastardly designed, too. I do show the puzzler a little bit of mercy. The background has a color gradient, unlike that t-shirt, to provide you some hints. So if you pick up a purple piece or a yellow piece, you'll kind of know where they go. So what would you call this? I would call it simply amazing. So I took one of my mazes that doesn't look like a maze, and with the help of the folks at Nervous System, and their wonderful software that they allow me to be very creative. I've turned this into a dastardly designed jigsaw puzzle maze, and I have a whole table of them over there, so yeah, here's my shameless promo. <laughs> the boxes don't reveal the fact that none of them are rectangular. They all have crazy borders, they all have dropouts, they all have whimsies, um, and they are much more fun than the puzzle count indicates. So I'll leave that on the table to give you a hint of what that puzzle looks like. There's only one, well, there might be two of them. So if you're really interested, see me later. Thanks, Dave, and I apologize again for missing the pictures resembling this.
Thank you everyone who uh, brought puzzles and, and shared your stories. Um, are you making an announcement? Okay, I'll hand the microphone back over to Anne. So, we are well ahead of schedule. Thanks to everybody for being very um, uh, mindful of the time that you've been allotted. I want to just take a few minutes before lunch uh, and to uh, make a few announcements. Then there will be about 15 minutes before lunch is actually served, in which case you can look at all these show and tell puzzles that have been displayed for you. Uh, we have, uh, I want to call your attention to the fact that we've lost some puzzlers since we last met in 2018. And um, I'm sure that um, there are more that we've lost that we just don't know about. Uh, but I want to mention a few that I do know about, and if you know of others, please let me know. Uh, so I want to uh, tell you about six puzzlers. Uh, the first is Hildegard Armstrong, uh, Bob's wife um, of 57 years, I think. Um, and uh, she's also the mother of Conrad Armstrong. Hildegard was a constant at our gatherings. Uh, she attended every parley from 1997 to 2016, a total of 11. And there's a remembrance of her on the easel over on the uh, right-hand side of the, well, your left-hand side of the hall. Uh, secondly, uh, Lisa Hollis, um, wife of Jay Hollis at Bogart's Puzzles. She came to at least four parleys. Um, Jay couldn't make it this time. Uh, he had a heart attack last year and his doctor said, you don't want to go anywhere near where you might get COVID, um, like a large gathering. Uh, but we want to remember Lisa. Uh, Terry Walters, uh, Grandpa TJ's puzzle. He was a Brit. He moved to the U.S. to be close to his daughter. Uh, and he attended three parleys and participated in a couple of puzzle exchanges. And Melinda has brought a couple of his puzzles to show. They're over there on that side of the ballroom. Uh, Nancy Ballhagen Moore, she cut Granny Nanny puzzles and several other brands of puzzles. Uh, she came um, uh, to the parlies in the 90s, and in, I think her last one was in 2008. She was from Missouri and has a, has a puzzle store um, uh, as well as making puzzles. Beverly Wellman, who was the founder of Fireside Puzzles of, of Maine, and uh, Paul Simpson, and a puzzler from uh, Toronto, um, who had planned to attend his uh, first party this year and sadly uh, passed away from cancer uh, before he could make it. So please keep them and their families in your thoughts. Uh, and um, yeah. Tom Tyler? Tom Tyler never made it to a parley, but you're right, we've, lo we've lost Tom Tyler. Uh, he did come um, to a, an AGPI, um, uh, in fact, he received the AGPI Spillsbury Award in uh, 2009, I believe. It, no, it wouldn't have been 2009. Um, I'm not sure, 2016 maybe. And um, so, and I know that there are others that we haven't heard of.